The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. I'm infested! That's right, let's talk about ticks. What the fuck? Yeah. Hey everyone, this is Michael T. Bradley. And Audrey Ivancy. We are today going to talk about Ticks, which is also known as Infested, apparently. It is one of the movies that I wanted to riff, uh, like I mentioned with Beastly. It's 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 uh, uh, something that was on the short list of films that I was excited to riff one day under the Ice on Mars Aegis, and instead we're looking at it in a slightly different way because I'm a lazy bastard. Let's talk about the plot synopsis overall. Audrey, you want to lead the way there? Sure. So this movie, Ticks, is about some kids that go out of the woods that are invited as some sort of project experience for troubled teens from the inner city. And they uh, go out to the woods, and there's apparently some weed operations going on, Monsanto style, where they um, have herbal steroids that they inject into the weed plants, which have somehow dripped down from below where they're grown to infect a tick and supersize them. The plot ensues when the ticks attack. So it's it's a bunch of teens going to a cabin in the woods, but not just to have sex. They also have, they're, they're there for... Ticks with dicks. Right, they're there, they're there for an inner city youth project thing, led by Peter Scolari and some chick. Peter Scolari, if you don't know right off the top of your head, is the other half of Bosom Buddies, not Tom Hanks. And we've got some other stars in the movie, but I'm sure they will come up as we go along. First, let's do the what the fuck moments. I'll start out. Clint Howard plays a filthy, slightly mutant pot grower, as usual. He listens to the BBC News. A tick with a bloody syringe hanging out of its body is crawling around a vet's office. We get the line, damn that crazy kid. A giant tick grows out of panic, the character's dead body. And the kind of queen... Tick, if you will. It's really not the queen, but the essentially, giant. yeah, it's essentially our queen from Aliens. Tick gets a Death Star explosion when it dies, which is <laughs> awesome. Like a like a oh, what's that called? That ring of I don't know, but it just it, it's it's an explosion that looks as if they put uh, like you see in a movie. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, it looks like it reminded me of the Death Star explosion. So there are uh, quite a few things to talk about with this movie, and uh, I don't know whether to start here or end here, but I'll just go ahead and bring it up because I think it's the, the biggest thing to talk about. It's kind of the elephant in the room. This movie is almost great. It is almost really, really a, a fun, good horror movie. But instead, something just falls a little flat. And I thought it was a movie. That <laughs> That's one way to sum it up. That, that So we have a, t a very talented cast overall. We have... Uh, Seth Green. Right, Peter Scolari. Some guy named Steve Grass. <laughs> He wasn't in the cast. It doesn't was... matter. His name is Grass. <laughs> uh, we also have Alfonso Ribera, Ribiera. R Rib oh, God, I don't know. Ribiera? Ribieri? Ribiero. I, Ribiero. I, don't, I don't know Ribiero how to say it. And we forgot to look him up to see what he was on, but you guys probably know, right? Was it, was it, it was, I think it was Different Strokes or that Silver Spoons. Guess. So, in any case, we have him. We have Amy Dolan's, uh, Mickey Dolan's daughter. From the monkey. Yeah, so we have, uh, and the sheriff. I know I've seen him in other things. Movies. Yes. Uh, the So we have this incredibly talented cast. Brian Yuzna was the executive producer, and he obviously did not skimp on the budget for actors or effects. The effects were really well yeah. done. Very good effects. The screenplay... I thought it was very close to being good, and I thought if it just were more self-referential, if it just realized that it was a cheesy horror movie rather than trying to play certain things seriously, and here, I think a good way to showcase how this fell flat in the sense of the characters is to talk about some of the characters. So we've got Seth Green, who plays... PTSD kid. And he wears a camo jacket and acts as if he's been in Nam. Yes. And so I really was like... I'm like, weed, Seth Green. What are we trying to say here? What are we trying to say here in 1993? So it really seemed to me... Monsanto like, is bad with weed. Don't, don't even, mix. I don't even know what Monsanto means. <laughs> yes, uh, do. Do I? Yeah, they have all those poisonous seeds that, like, BT corn and shit, 
and their seeds and crops fail, and they have genetically modified stuff. So Seth Green <laughs> wears a camo jacket and acts like, and it has PT. I mean, he doesn't act like he has PTSD. The character has PTSD. From being in the woods? Right, from being left in the woods by his dad at one point. With and nothing but a trail of breadcrumbs to follow. <laughs> something. And all he does is hug a tree and go, Daddy? <laughs> Which, it's it's like... What? But the one thing that I will say is that at least that character's background was very clearly defined early on. And he and did wear those Harry Potter glasses right. around Potter. Yeah, there well, again. I, I assume that Seth Green just used to need those glasses because he wore... Well, I guess the character Richie Tozier and it had those glasses, so maybe maybe it's just a character. He just kept getting sidled with characters who wore giant glasses. I don't know. But then, like, for instance, Alfonso Riviera plays possibly a gangbanger, or it really felt like he was playing a kid who was trying to pass himself off as one. Yeah, like he said, I what I want my piece, I wish I brought my piece, I thought I was going to go out by a drive-by. Right, yeah, and it's like, but he just looks so well quaffed, and I mean quaffed isn't the right word. He looked for, very California. Yeah, he looked, he, he looked like he was pretending, and it was never quite clear if Why he was, he was wearing those hammer pants. <laughs> That too. Well, I think it's because he left in the middle of the night and he didn't bother getting changed into real clothes. And so he just had pajama pants yeah. on. But it was never clear, is this really like a troubled inner city youth who's been in a gang? Or is it just some guy who likes to pretend to be tough? Because we get the line from Holly, the kind of director of the youth group, you still trying to be the toughest kid on the block? Said to him because the writing's bad. Mm-hmm. And um, I noticed that, remember the, the main camp leader guy? Peter Scolari. Peter Scolari. He's like psychologically profiling all the students there to see that they <laughs> won't get along. Out of left field. Just one more line before I get to him. Alfonso Ribieri, supposedly inner city troubled youth who runs with gangs and expects to go out by drive-by, has the line, Who died and made you, Dr. Welby? <laughs> Dr. Marcus Welby. A, like... CBS medical drama from the late 70s? What what the fuck is with this kid? What's he doing? You know, like, that's a line that would totally fit in Boys in the Hood, right? Who died and made you, Dr. Welby? So to talk about Peter Scolari, though, who is kind of the co-leader of the camp and definitely the one chick's uh, father, Mm -hmm. but I wasn't clear... Whose thing, uh, whose idea this trip was? Like, I is it that he's recently dating Holly? Yeah, because he has a bag full of prophylactics. Oh, I assume that was Rome who had the bag full of prophylactics. I think he was just going through everyone's bag. That's right. What he found he went through the first bag and found the steroids, and he went through the second bag and found the prophylactics. Right, but Rome and Dee Dee we saw had many, many, many bags. So, oh, okay. so that was my assumption, but. Who knows, that could have been Peter Scolari's. <laughs> it made sense to me. Either way, it really, since those are the only two couples we have through the whole thing, but literally, I did not know through the entire film what his relationship was to Holly. I, I think that he was kind of the new stepdad in their lives, but I'm not 100% sure. Did you get a feeling on that? Uh, uh, not really. Because, like, at one point, Seth Green says to the daughter, oh, but you like coming out here with your dad, right? And she says, yeah, I guess. And it's like, wait, is he talking about Peter Scolari? Or is he talking, did did she have a dad who died? Oh, no, it's definitely his dad, the dad dad figure, yeah. That was so unclear to me that, that I felt it was very confusing. And I'm like, this is a thing that you maybe want to explain. The, uh, like, for instance, with Panic, who's Alfonso Rivera, Panic had the perfect chance to see his backstory and get whether he was really a tough hood or if he was... Prince of Bel-Air. D- exactly the comment I was going to make. Weird. He gets infected, or uh, he gets bitten by a tick which has LSD in its little pincers, and so people start tripping. tripping. And we see a trip of his where he's, like, in a like in a shed with a burning garbage bin in front of him, and I'm like, he could have hallucinated stuff that actually happened to him, and we could have gotten his backstory there, but instead, he just immediately sees what's going on in real life, and it really just doesn't go anywhere. Then we have the 
quiet, mysterious, slightly Asian girl who drops that line the first time she talks. Well, after I was raped, it was hard to talk to people. She just says this to, like, a complete stranger. Well, they're fishing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Typical fishing conversation, right? I sometimes I don't feel like talking. After I was raped, and it's like, whoa, that's yeah, really... Yeah, certainly. And then, like, immediately the other girl is like, I didn't like the way that guy looked at me. I think he was having thoughts about doing something, and it's like... Really? Like, yeah. way, to, way, to be, way to be understanding here. And the other thing, too, is like, just in general, so if this is Peter Scolari's first time up there, right, why is he making these, like, sociological notes as if he knows exactly what's going to go on? And if Holly's the one, Holly being his girlfriend or wife or whatever... Banging for the weekend. If, if she's the one who's done this tons of times before, why isn't she better at her job? She just seems like bitchy and confused most of the time. Mm -hmm. Rome and Dee Dee are pretty well-defined. They are, you know, uh, we, we they get really well-defined like within three lines. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, it, it was kind of bludgeoned into the script, but it was good. I mean, we, we after that, we knew we, them, Seth Green, we just get, you know, here's our backstory, everybody. How's it going? And, and it's like, okay, that's cool. Uh, I can run with that. Also, I love that Seth Green's dad has that line where he's like, I'm trying to do this to help you get better. So to get over your PSD about me leaving you in the woods alone, <laughs> I'm going to leave you in the woods with strangers for a weekend. And some LSD. <laughs> and weed. And ticks. And ticks. <laughs> so it's like his dad, just not a very good dad overall. I like it when the tick plays fetch with the stick. Tick with the stick. Tick with the stick. Then later, tick after dick. Tick <laughs> Your dick. Um, I thought this movie was a little bit like, you know, if you were to mix Alien, Gremlins, Arachnophobia, Friday the 13th, Slither, and The Blob together. You might get what this kind of visually looked like. Sure, yeah. And then take about 30% of that budget away, like 50% maybe. All of it. I mean, it wasn't, it, they obviously put some money and some effort into the effects, but it wasn't anywhere near as uh, high quality as any of those that you listed. That's right. Um, so, I think that what the little creepy legs on the ticks actually sounded mechanical. You know what I loved more than the mechanical tick sound was the fact that the tick sacks obviously had little violins inside them, because whenever <laughs> the camera would pan over them, you'd get that <laughs> sound. Yeah, then we got a tick cam. Tick cam. Very much like the puppet cam from Puppet Master and recurring motifs. What is with bear traps and horror movies? This is the third movie we've watched out of, what, seven or so? Well, I don't think a lot of people are catching bears anymore, so I think the prop master just gives them out. <laughs> like, buy one couch, get a free bear trap. Yeah, they aren't, uh, they aren't making themselves prevalent in, in movies anymore, so they just go to... Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. It's very strange. I don't know much about growing pot, but I would imagine it does not take anywhere near the liquid that we see involved in the opening credits. I don't think so. I think you're just supposed to have, like, a lamp or something and then probably the <laughs> water. I, you know, I mean, it's a plant, right? So yeah, It needs light and it needs water. And, and soil, right? Oh, yeah, that too. I mean, we see goo. vats of goo. liquid and goo, goo. right, yeah. that... It's, it's, I mean... I, that, I think, is the herbal steroid that they're pumping into their weed plants. With some LSD that... Yeah, it's, it's Clint... Clint Howard is an artiste. He doesn't... <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't believe in half measures. He's... You know, the, the sheriff points out that after the local economy went bad, people turned to uh, uh, to growing pot. So, mm -hmm. obviously, he was like a puff pastry chef or something. Yeah, and he wanted, you know, more bang for his buck. Right. He wanted, um, you know, bigger plants, bigger, better, faster. Maybe he had like a Thai fusion place. Yeah. I thought when Seth Green's dad sent him here, it was a good metaphor for prison. Because uh, essentially, he's like, I'm doing this to make you get better. And then he's put into this... Uh, group of apparent convicts and felons <laughs> and uh people who like i mean it's just like the worst situation to be in even if you took away the ticks yeah like horny felons right <laughs> so prison with basically children. <laughs> right so well that's not quite so prison the molestation thing could be yes if it happened in the movie but it right. didn't mm -mm. 
you know, talking of the creepy molestation guy, uh, I mean, it never actually happens, but he keeps leering at people. Oh, yeah, through the window. Right. The uh, He is this kind of bearded guy who works... Brown teeth. Yeah, who works for a guy who keeps demanding that other people call him sir, and, and nobody does. And he uses a comb to brush back his hair every, every chance the camera shoots his face. Yeah, the, the, uh, those characters, what the hell was up with them? We weren't... I think they were pot growers as well. But I think was, they were you know, maintaining the compound, you know, making sure that people weren't going to come and steal the weed, and then they probably were had a part of the operation. Yeah, though it wasn't necessarily clear if they were related to Clint Howard or if they just were other pot growers. Yeah. They seemed, I who knows, but they, uh, again, they were characters who weren't really well defined and kind of took up a lot of the movie. I mean, they, especially the third act, where it kind of sort of turns into Night of the Living Dead, meets some home invasion movie. But still, their part isn't exactly clear. They're, you know, I was like, are they lovers? Are they pot growers? Are they just general... Hoodlums. Hoodlums. They, they Hoodigans. Just, after, after the local economy crashed, they just, that's what they did. Population four. Exactly. I also thought, so speaking of the third act, there's this part where Seth Green's character kind of sort of has like a hero moment where he's swinging out on the fishing pole line with a tire, which that whole plan, <laughs> I was like, I don't think this works with physics. Are you talking I, about the the bed sheets, right? No, before the bed sheets, oh. she, the girl who's the raped girl, because that's the only bit we get about her, throws a fishing line out and then Seth Green rides the a tire down on it and then it snaps, which I was like, okay, it snapped because I guess at least that's realistic. But everybody's like, this plan will work. And Seth Green, like, has this hero moment. And I thought there was so much potential to Seth Green's character just kind of, like, Ram snapping. Out. Going kind of crazy. And they never really played that up. And I thought that was a real missed opportunity. Like, at one point, he just full-on bull rushes the dude with a knife who's threatening the girl. Mm -hmm. And the guy doesn't do anything about it. And... <laughs> And just gets tossed onto the couch by him. And I was like, this, and, and, he, and it might have even been a gun that he was threatening him with. And we've already seen him shoot somebody else. So it's like, you know, it, it was like that, that was pretty crazed heroics from Seth Green, which since he was a Vietnam vet makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but it's weird the way that it's downplayed so much in the movie. I think they should have just gone full bore and made it that he was a 13-year-old Vietnam vet. I like that. With flashbacks and... That needs to smoke weed in order to get better. Right. It's and a, it's... LSD actually might help too. Mushrooms? Oh, they, they missed the opportunity for mushrooms. There could I have know. been a cow farm nearby. It could have been. Population 4.5. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. I am from somewhere with a lot of cows. We don't actually include the cattle in the population census. One cow, one vote. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're uh, they're five sevenths of a vote. I think one of my favorite lines was, "I just want to go back to Arizona." <laughs> and it made me think of Frisky Dingo. We can never go back to Arizona. That's immediately what I thought. <laughs> it's Frisky Dingo. <laughs> Frisky Dingo is what the guy, most of the guys who did Archer did before they did Archer. Oh, yeah, okay. gotcha. Uh, looks a lot like Archer, has the same sort of humor, and uh, I, I preferred it, but I still like Archer. Yeah. Anyway. But the, in any case, we can never go back there. So, <laughs> Do you have stuff that you want to talk about? Uh, ticks on people's faces, ticks on dicks, ticks on tummies. <laughs> Ticks growing out of Panic's body and becoming yeah. supersized. Yeah, you know, I was a little sad about Panic's death. Panic gets an awesome last final scene, though. I mean, he's fucking, like, stabbing people. <laughs> then he gets shot, and he still somehow crawls back to the house. Then, of course, the queen, Queen Latika, comes out of him. <laughs> And that's... Because he had been taking steroids that he had stole from one of the other kids. Oh, that's right. So that he can get back to the house, he takes steroids because he's, like, bleeding out. And he's like, I gotta fucking make it just to be like, Holly, I like you. Goodbye. So the giant ticks were, became even bigger if you added human steroids. Apparently. Yeah. At least in one case. It doesn't... It, you know, it's like, we just... We need a big tick for people to fight. Yeah, totally. There has to be some, like, something to kill that's big. 
You kept having reactions whenever the ticks would get on people's faces. Oh, yeah, they gnawing at their lips, trying right. to stick their little mechanical fingers in there and open them up. And, and then that one guy, um, what's his name again? Clint Howard. Clint, ha yeah, yeah, Clint Howard. When they went inside of his face and was removing the skin, there was just an opening for the eye slit with no eyeball in there, just darkness, because the, the rest of his cheeks had been imploded by these... Ticks. I think that was just the bad light. <laughs> he definitely didn't have an eye. <laughs> the, uh, the, yeah, but it was like pulsing out of his skin. That's where the I'm infested line comes from, mm -hmm. which was, you know, that's the poster right there. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I say, they're, they're, the effects are good. There are a lot of creepy little moments, a lot of, like, you didn't like when Panic had the, like, the gushing blood Oh, on yeah, his so he got, he got bit, and he smashed the tick on his knee. With and then, a, with a, with a switchblade. Something like that. And then he pulled off the tick after a struggle to find that there was something oozing out of his leg that he continued to apply pressure to, and more came out. Yeah, there was just a lot of exploding blood sacks and oozing bits and dripping. Yeah. It, Gremlins it, and arachnophobia. And, and aliens. And definitely. aliens. Oh, definitely. definitely. Especially it, in the vet. Yeah, so, yeah, I was just going to say, especially with the autopsy scene, yeah. we get uh, it all gushing about there and, and the syringe being... Trying to pull the blood. That was very reanimator. Yeah, the, trying to pull the blood and it pulls back and it, oh man. It, it well, it makes sense. I mean, executive producer Brian Yasna, who directed Brighter Reanimator. So, I mean, it's it's kind of a fun movie. I mean, honestly, like I watched this years ago and the things that I remembered about it were the horrible lines and the kind of low budgetness. And I just remember it not being very good. But I, honestly, this is probably my favorite out of everything we've watched so far. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> it is it again for me. This is the thing that is so frustrating about it is that I feel it's very, very, very close to being a really good movie. Right now, it's kind of meh. It's but a that's kind of like saying the Leprechaun is really, really close to being a really good movie because I actually like the Leprechaun better. Both of them. I like two. I didn't really care for one as much, but I, I did enjoy two, uh, but not as much as this. And I didn't feel like either of them had this closeness to being great, which I really do think this one did. I mean, only if they d developed one character a little bit better, it would have been a totally different movie. Like Seth Green or the, you know, one of the camp counselor guys. Well, uh, that's kind of, I think you could you could go one of two ways with it. Either one, you, you make this focused far more on one character because Panic's Last Stand, that scene really stood out to me in the sense where it was like, this movie could be really interesting if it was just one person struggling through this and struggling through all the these weed growers, these other weed growers, the sheriffs, this, you know, crazy camp counselors who, like, didn't believe him or whatever. And if we just followed Panic all the way through, this would be awesome. But as it was, I'm watching Alf Alfonso Riviera have this amazing scene, and I'm like, I don't know jack shit about your character. I don't know if I'm happy or sad, I you know. And it was, it was this ensemble piece where you were just expected to care for everybody just because... We're watching Nightmare on Elm Street Dream Warriors. <laughs> <laughs> it just didn't have that element, you know, where where you could get into every character. And yeah. I think they're trying to do that. Yeah, and, and I think you could have done it if you didn't write shit like, this place isn't cable ready. Like, they spend so much time writing the characters so you would get, this is a preppy bitch, and this kid is scared. Here's you know? Uncle Jesse. Right. <laughs> John like, Stamos. <laughs> like, say, right, that John Stamos guy who couldn't, like, they were like, it's in your contract, you cannot wear a shirt at any point on set. <laughs> ha can, I, can I have a half shirt? Okay. But it can't be buttoned. All right, all right. Uh, that's the thing that I would change. I would either focus it in on one character so it works as a horror movie, or I would have them, I would go in and be like, okay, you really well defined the characters mostly. Because like about half the characters I felt really solid on, but I felt really solid on them after their first three lines. After that, it's just those same three lines over and over again. And then once the shit hits the fan, they all turn stupid uh, into stupid horror movie characters. Like I was saying earlier, I hate the fact that there's this line, they bring in this chick into the cabin, they get her away from all the ticks and everything. She's been bitten, and she's obviously, like, 
flipping the fuck out. Tripping. Shaking. Tripping. Yeah, tripping balls, shaking, and bloody, and Peter Scolari puts her on the couch, and I think it's his line. It's tough to tell because it's all 80 yard and fucked up there. But somebody says, like, just give her some air. She'll be fine. And it's like, it's just such a stupid, meaningless thing to have, and it's just noise. You know, it's just white noise. And a lot of the lines, especially in the second half of the movie, were just white noise. Mm-hmm. And so I think it could have been really, really, really good if the script just had a little bit more polish to it. Yeah, and then it's not like the music saved it at all. <laughs> oh, that music. Oh the my the God. Casio keyboard um, action fight scene noises yeah. effects. Um, the, the pow, the whoosh. <laughs> <laughs> Every, every time somebody punched someone, it obviously was this like side of beef being hit yeah. and pumped up to 11 on the noise. And then we the had cocoon the cocoon music. Right. We had the cocoon music and we had the like night, the, what's it called? The Starman? The day the Grinch stole. Stole Christmas. Yeah. 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 We had that sort of like the Grinch move. His heart grew through. Well, something's sizes. exploding. Right. Well, they the, have, the like... forest was burning <laughs> and it's like the, and, and the ticks are exploding and it's like bing. Ding, 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 we were in Disneyland. Yeah, it was it was a little off kilter. But so what 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 would you have changed? I have two. Okay, so I would say more Seth Green Rambo style. Yeah, yeah, I liked him. Um, actually, I have three. Sorry, uh, more deaths of the locals. So you know, we just had the cop, and we had um, Clint Howard. Right, which the cop, unless I totally am forgetting, it happened off screen, didn't it? I think so. I mean, yeah, that we found the body. Right, and it's it's assumed that those other guys killed him because the car yeah, was hit. Yeah, probably for for checking out the weed operation. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, they're just not a lot of people died. I think right. there's a lot of survivors. Um, and then finally, I'd like more the LDS to do some LSD. That's Latter Day Saints. Were there Latter Day Saints in here? No, but it would have been really cool. <laughs> <laughs> just make one of the characters LDS and then somebody could get the line LDS is on LD, LSD yep. got it okay <laughs> I want somebody on Law and Order SVU to drive an SUV um, <laughs> <laughs> the yeah in, in, it didn't need more deaths I mean this was this was a movie that loved its exploding blood sack loved its horrible you know we, we uh, head splits open for a tick to come out of it we have all of that sort of stuff, yet it felt very precious about its main Sunday characters. Sunday movie. Yes. <laughs> Bring grandma. <laughs> Beca- and and uh, also a little, only the black character got killed. It was uh, yeah, the main group, you know? What are you trying to say, Michael? I, I'm not going to say it's racist because we did have somebody, two, the slightly Asian girl and the possibly Hispanic guy survived. So I guess, you know. It's only know. racist towards black people. Right. <laughs> That's all. But it just, it, it felt, it, it felt uneven for certain. Yeah, not enough people died. For a movie this bloody, there should have been way more death. Definitely. Yeah. Um, you should have felt sick by the end of it. Yeah, and like those ticks should have just destroyed some more bodies. I, th- I think the mystery girl should have just been uh, killed before we found out anything about her. And then, you know, it's like, wow. I, wow, we, we she never was even... killed because she got raped. Well, no, I, we shouldn't, we shouldn't. <laughs> We shouldn't even find that out. We just, it's just like she dies in some horrible way, and it's like everybody's like, wow, I don't, I don't, you know, I didn't even know anything about her. Mm-hmm. Definitely one of the parents of Peter Scolari gets shot in the leg, and then he's just fine after that. Yeah. He should have bled out. More blood. Definitely more, more blood. More guts. More blood, more guts. On that note, <laughs> Audrey's giving me a look, and she's going to pounce. <laughs> you put the ice pick down, put the piranha down. All right, so uh, uh, until next time, this is Michael T. Bradley. And Audrey Ivancy. And if you would like to give us feedback, thoughts, suggestions. Ticks. Don't give us ticks. Any of those sorts of things, write us at info at iceonmars.net. Until next time. Bye. You have been listening to Ice on Mars.